Um, all right, so um, before we begin, there are a couple of admin administrative announcements that need to be made. Uh, so basically, first and foremost, um, we would like to inform you that one, the seminar will be recorded, right? Um, so, you know, people, please feel free to turn off your uh, cameras or mics and be muted as well. Uh, but this, this session will be recorded and this recordings will be posted on SG Tech's website and YouTube channel, um, as well as the fact that the, the slide deck will be sent out together with whatever this web link uh, is ready as well. So um, the last thing I want to say that is for any Q&A, right, please post in this, uh, the chat after uh, any questions which you may have, and I will answer them, uh, you know, after my presentation. So all in all, this presentation will last about an hour, 15 minutes, an hour and 30, hour and a half. And, uh, you know, with the last 30 minutes for Q&A, if there are any questions, all right? So, um, to begin with, right? So as we now know, right? Nowadays, technology advancements have evolved our ever-growing digital economy and landscape. And this shift towards dig digitalization have changed the way how organizations operate and do business, right? So because of that, IMD believes that the following trends to be the future of data privacy. One, consumers increasing demand for privacy. Right. According to IBM's Institute for Business Value Studies, more than 80% of consumers say that they have become increasingly concerned right, on how companies use their personal information, while 75% say that they are less likely to trust companies with their personal information. As overall, right, consumers therefore are much more conscious of the importance of data protection, and this should not be taken lightly by companies and organizations and businesses as well. Right. Number two, digitalization leading to a data overload. I'm sure that we are all familiar with big with trends like big data, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. Right. Data is increasingly viewed as the new fuel of the modern digital economy. And with an exponential increase in the volume of personal data that's being collected, generated, and used, it is important to foster an, an environment of trust and confidence amongst businesses. Right. Number three, increasing the num increasing number of data breaches. Now, with an increase in of the data flows, the number of data breaches are expected to increase as well. And it is not a matter of if, but when this will happen as well. Only, right? Personal data has always been the crown jewel of most cyber incidences and data breaches, and it can be a costly affair in terms of financial and reputational loss for businesses and organizations. Lastly, data protection is going to be a business differentiator. While most organizations and people would see that data protection as a matter of compliance, IMDA wants to change that mindset and help companies realize that investing in data protection would help them build consumer trust more easily and stand out from their competition. <laughs> right, so, First part of this webinar is we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you a overview of the Personal Data Protection Act or the PDPA in short. Now, organizational accountability and good data governance can be demonstrated through the PDPA. Now, enacted in 2012, the PDPA acts as a baseline law that sets out the rules and standards of protection on the collection, use, and disclosure of personal data. With that said, the Act not only recognizes the rights of consumers to protect their data, but the needs of organizations to collect and use personal data in legitimate, uh, for legitimate purposes as well, right? <laughs> so basically, this diagram illustrates a typical data flow cycle of a business or an organization where the PDPA applies to the collection, use, and disclosure of personal data. Now, personal data is defined as data about an individual who can be uniquely identified 
from that data or from that data and other information that the organization has or is likely to have access to. Now, it can be in the form of customer information, enrollment forms, employee records, the job application forms, membership forms, basically any form of paperwork or online forms which collect personal data, right? Often businesses collect personal data from customers, employees, members for transaction, marketing, or audit purposes, which is then disclosed to perhaps a subsidiary, a data intermediary, or the organization's HQ or other group companies as well, right? <laughs> now, moving on to touch on one of the provisions under the PDPA, the data protection provisions or obligations in short. Now, organizations who have heard of the PDPA, right? would be well aware or familiar with the fact that initially the PDPA had nine data protection provisions obligations. With the new PDPA Amendment Act, right, there are now a total of 11 obligations. And these two new obligations are actually the data breach notification and the data portability obligations. Now, this data portability, data portability obligation will only take effect after the regulations are issued, right? So basically, it is still something that's in the works right now. Now, with the act, if, okay, so basically, the data protection regime is basically, in this case, technology neutral. So it covers both electronic and non-electronic -elect, uh, forms of data and does not prescribe a certain level of technology in the management and secure and the way the personal data is secured. Right, it is principles based. It is based on consent, purpose, and reasonableness. Right, uh, the PDPA is complaints based, which means generally the PDPC will not conduct audits on a company's level of PDPA compliance, but is based on complaints or feedback that's received by the commission instead. The obligations are bucketed into three broad phases of the data lifecycle with accountability as the overarching team entrenched within the data management lifecycle. Now, the obligations are bucketed into three broad phases. I mean, accountability basically refers to a risk-based approach to identify, monitor, and respond to data risk through the life cycle, data lifecycle, right? Its importance is highlighted when, we, when basically the IMDA and PDPC rename the openness obligation to the accountability obligation back in 2019. Now, essentially, the end, the end goal is to move all organizations from being to a state of being responsible for personal data and how an organization should discharge its responsibility for personal data under your organization's possession. Now, as part of being accountable, an organization will need to appoint a data protection officer this is a mandatory requirement under the PDPA, right? And this data protection officer or DPO in short will oversee compliance to the PDPA and implement data protection policies and processes, including making them available upon an individual's request. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. The first bucket is collection of personal data. As an organization, starts to collect personal data. The first set of blue obligations kicks in, which is notification, consent, and purpose limitation, right? The requirement to notify individuals of the purpose of data collection, use, and disclosure, obtain their consent, and to limit the use to what individuals have consented to, right? Now, the second bucket, the green, uh, the green, basically, the green uh, segment, right? Care of personal data. Right, organizations need to ensure personal data is held is accurate with proper safeguards over the protection of personal data, right? To which they are collected or in, is, are in possession of, right? There must also be limits on how long an organization can hold on to personal data. And if there are no justifications, the personal data must be destroyed or deleted, right? Last but not least, the last group, the orange. Uh, group would be the in uh, would be the individual's autonomy over their own personal data. The last set of obligations basically relates to the interaction and the communications with individuals 
in response to their rights and control over their own personal data under the PDPA. Right. So, what it is important to now go through what are the <clears throat> It's important that organizations maintain good data protection practices, or basically they will run the risk of suffering a data breach and getting in trouble with the regulators. Now, the PDPC has seen an increase in the number of cases in the last few years, right? And while there was a slight drop in 2021 and 2022 in the number of published cases, right? It does not mean that companies are not getting hit by data breaches. In fact, right? IMDA and PDPC have seen a 54% jump in the number of cyber incidences in the form of ransomware attacks, and thus the protection obligation remains the highest obligation breached in 2022. Right? As you can see, the top data protection breaches are the breach of the protection obligation at 79%. Right? At second and third place, at 12% each, it is the breach of consent and notification obligations. And the last, the third one is the breach of the accountability obligation. All right. In this case, this is the case study, right? The background is that PDPC received feedback that personal data users of company XYZ and ICT SME had been exposed. The data containing database containing personal data was accessed and exfiltrated from the company staging databases, which contain real and fake personal data to facilitate development and testing. Right. So in all total, the database comprised of almost 252,000 records. And this was accessed and exfiltrated from the organization, right? The staging database is a synthetic database containing personal data of 3,916 actual users, while the remaining 200 over 1,000 records were actually fake or dummy data modeled after real data. Now, basically, the synthetic database was used to facilitate development and testing on the staging service and the personal data from the 300, uh, the 3,916 actual users were exposed, basically included name, username, email addresses, contact numbers for some users and a password hash. Now, the findings concluded the company had breached the protection and accountability obligations by allowing employees to store copies of the staging database on their personal devices without adequate security measures using real personal data when synthetic data would have sufficed and lacking data protection policies and practices to guide staff on complying with the PDPA. So at the end of the day, this company was fined $12,500 by the PDPC, right? An overview of the PDPA amendments in 2020. Now, these are the key amendments affecting financial penalties Right. So while encouraging and strengthening organizational accountability, right, the PDPC is also enhancing its penalty and enforcement regime to deter irresponsible behavior, right, with new offenses for individuals and increased penalties for organizations, right. So in this case, for the under data protection, the financial penalty caps for organizations have been increased to up to $1 million or 10% of <clears throat> a company's annual gross turnover, right? This is to align itself with the MAS Act and the Public Sector Governance Act, right? These new offenses were also introduced to hold individuals accountable for egregious cases on ill intention of, of mishandling personal data in the possession of or under the control of an organization. So for individuals, Right, it's up to five thousand dollars on imprisonment of not exceeding two years or both. Right, the offenses for egregious mishandling of personal data, knowing or recklessly unauthorized disclosure of personal data, use of personal data for gain or to cause harm to another person, or re-identification of anonymized data would basically fall under uh, these categories. So, and what is an act? <clears throat> Right, so under do not call, the financial penalty caps have been moved upwards as well. So organizations, it is now up to 1 million or 5% of annual turnover, whichever is higher. For individuals, right, the pen, financial penalties can be up to $200,000. And this increase in financial penalty caps 
have taken effect from 1st of October 2022 onwards, right? So I guess what is most significant nowadays, oh, sorry, my bad. Sorry, okay. Um, the second important topic we talk about today is mandatory data breach notification, right? With increasing number of data breaches, the amendment bill has introduced a new obligation to report data breaches to the PDPC in cases where breaches are likely to result in significant harm or impact to individuals or is of a significant scale, right? So what is considered, you know, um, significant harm. So personal data that's considered likely to result in significant harm being compromised, an individual being compromised would be an individual's full name or national identification number, plus any of the other following information such as financial, medical, life and health insurance, vulnerable persons, private key to authenticate or to authorize a record or transaction, right? So basically, once these are uh, uh, once these have been mm, compromised, right? These would have likely be uh, trigger the significant harm threshold. Now, for significant scale, anything more than five hundred affected individuals would trigger this reporting obligation, right? Um, organizations must also notify affected individuals in cases where a data breach is likely to result in significant harm or impact to them, regardless of the scale of the breach, right? This new obligation enables individuals to take further steps to protect themselves when notified, for example, changing passwords or canceling or suspending their credit cards in case their financial information may have been leaked. Some exceptions from the need to notify affected individuals include where organizations have taken remedial actions, right? Such that the breach is not likely to result in significant harm or impact to individuals or where they have technological protection measures in place, for example, encryption, to try and limit the potential harm caused by any data breaches, right? For more information about this, right, please, uh, you can refer to PDPAC's advisory guidelines on key concepts in PDPA as well as there's a data breach management advisory guideline that has been published as well, right? So number three, the enhanced framework to support data use, right? The Act Amendment, all right, also introduces the enhanced framework for collection, use, and disclosure of personal data, right? Organizations can now use personal data for more purposes recognized under the PDPA, such as for you know, under new exceptions, business improvement, legitimate interests, exceptions which have been revised include business asset transactions, research and development, right? And then broaden deemed consent, which is deemed consent by contractual performance and deemed consent by notification, right? Uh, this will en basically enable organizations to use data to innovate, secure, and meet consumers' needs so long as they comply with the relevant safeguards and requirements for example, the need to conduct risk assessments, allowing individuals to withdraw consent at any time, et cetera, right? So under new exceptions, right? To cater to situations where there are larger public or systemic benefits where obtaining individual's consent may or may not be appropriate, right? organizations will be able to use personal data collected for the purposes of business improvement, right? Uh, for example, operational efficiencies and service and de developing of products and services, etc. The use of data for business improvement is packed to what a reasonable person would consider appropriate in the circumstances. Right? For example, a credit card company deriving insights on existing customers' spending habits to develop new lines of, of credit cards or reward schemes, for example. Right? So the conditions for this to utilize these new exceptions would be, it can only be used for existing and prospective customers only, under basically what a reasonable person would consider appropriate in the circumstances, 
or for sharing of personal data within an organization or between different entities of the same group of company, right? So there's another one called legitimate, legitimate interest, right? Organizations will be able to collect use of disclosed personal data for where it is in the legitimate or lawful interest of the organization. And the benefit to the public is greater than any adverse effect on the individuals, right? Uh, so in this case, it is, for example, hotels getting together to compile and share a blacklist of hotel skippers who do not fulfill payment for the use of hotel services, right? Again, there are obviously conditions packed to the use of this legitimate interest exception, and this would include needing to conduct assessments and balancing tests. These sample checklists are available by the PDPC to articulate to individuals what the benefits are, right? whether they are real and present, and to disclose that the organization is relying on this exception through its data protection policy, or to provide the BCI of the person that the customers can get in touch with if they have any questions or queries. Under revised exceptions, right? There are business asset. The revised business exceptions includes the first one, business asset transactions, whereby you can organizations are allowed to collect, use, and disclose personal data without consent um, for business asset transactions. And this is broadened to include the scope more uh, beyond the sale of assets, but to also include activities such as mergers and acquisitions, sale of shares, transfers of controlling power of interest corporate restructuring and reorganization, right? In the second case, research and development, the use and disclosure of personal data without consent uh, has been expanded to enable organizations to use data and conduct broader art research and development that may not have been immediate applications to their products and services. For example, labs carrying out R&D, right? Research consultants doing market research or studies, or disclosure of data for historical or statistical research, right? In this case, C, broaden deemed consent. Now, uh, to further, finally, to facilitate the use and processing of personal data for business purposes, right? Uh, the concept of deemed consent uh, has been expanded to cover deemed consent by contractual performance. Now, this is for the disclosure of personal data recognizing multiple layers of outsourcing to facilitate data sharing. For example, an online retailer disclosing customers' personal data to logistics partners for order fulfillment. This is allowed so that it is and, and, and will ensure that a smoother and faster service delivery to the customer, right? The second one is uh, deemed consent by notification, right? Uh, where this is the use and disclosure of personal data for secondary purposes and whereby the organization is unable to rely on any existing exceptions. exceptions. So this not um, being concerned by notification is whereby individuals have been notified of the purpose of the intended collection, use and disclosure of their personal data and are given a reasonable opportunity to opt out and have not opted out, right? There are again conditions packed to using deemed consent by notification, and that includes conducting risk assessments to eliminate or mitigate adverse effects on individuals. Right? Again, the checklist is available by the PDPC, giving adequate notification with a reasonable opt-out period. And basically, even after that, individuals can withdraw their consent at any time, right? So in this case, an example would be hotel sharing members' preferences and reviews with travel websites so that you know, new travel packages can be developed. So data portability, right? A quick brief on the new data portability obligation. It is essentially to provide consumers with more autonomy over their data generated by their use of services, which enables them to request the transmission of their personal data to a new service provider. This is the, this is the obligation, right? That's not in effect yet. Um, not sure when it's gonna come out, um, but you know, please stay tuned to noti announcements by the PDPC, right? Um, and they will inform organizations when this obligation uh, is about to be launched, right? Understanding your role as a data intermediary, right? So in this day and age, when we do business, 
um, it is very common nowadays to either employ companies as data intermediaries to process or to you know process certain information on your company's behalf or in fact your organization may be a data intermediary to your to uh, your customers as well so excuse me so the de definition of a data intermediary under the PDPA in this case is an organization right uh, that processes personal data on behalf of a data controller pursuant to a contract, right? The DI or data the data intermediary or DI may carry out any operation or set of operations in relation to the personal data, which may include, uh, but are not limited to recording, holding, organization, adaptation, or alteration, retrieval, combination, transmission, and erasure or destruction of personal data. Now, data, uh, uh, DI is subject to the data protection provisions relating to the protection and retention of personal data, right? As well as the data breach notification obligations under the PDPA when it is processing personal data on behalf of the data controller and for the data controller's purposes, right? In the event that a data intermediary uses or discloses personal data in its possession or control beyond the remit granted by the data controller, the DI will be responsible for complying with all of the data protection provisions under the PDPA. Okay, Here's an here is an example of an organization and its data intermediary. The scenario is as such, right? A business enters into a contract with a printing company to create invitations to an event. The business gives the printing company the names and addresses of the invitees from its contact database, which the printer uses to address the invitations and envelopes. The business then sends out the invitations, right? The business is considered the organ. The business is considered the organization since it controls the personal data that's processed, or rather, in this case, the data controller, right? Uh, the business decides the purposes for which the personal data is processed, which is to send individually addressed invitations, right? And the means of the processing, which is the mail merging the personal data using the invitees' addresses. Addresses. The print. The printing company in this case is the data intermediary since it handles the personal data according to the data controller's instructions, right? Uh, the printing company cannot use, sell or use the personal data for other purposes, such as for its own marketing or publicity purposes, right? If the printing company disregards these limits and uses the data for its own purposes, it will then take on the role of an organization because it is now in control of and making decisions about how the personal data is used. In this case, the printing company would become subject to all the obligations imposed on a data controller, right? So this is the government's third party management framework, right? And as part of understanding your role as a DI, Right, uh, throughout the four stages of the third party management process. So stage one would be the event under would be the evaluation and selection stage, right? Stage two is the contracting and onboarding, stage three, service management, and stage four, transitioning out. So basically for the first stage, evaluation and selection. The key considerations for assessing the organization's ability to pick up a data intermediary data intermediary role would be to meet the data processing requirements and provide the protection and care that are commensurate with the volume and sensitivity of the data process, right? Your organization also has the necessary data protection framework, including policies, practices, and training for its staff, as well as the appropriate security arrangements to ensure personal data process will be properly safeguarded, right? For complex data processing activities, you know, you may need to show good track records and if data protection practices are subject to uh, external reviews and validation, right? So for example, if your organization possesses the data protection trust mark certification. So for contracting and onboarding, right? 
you have to have a clear understanding of the data controller's scope of outsourcing and its personal data protection requirements. You have to have binding contractual agreements in place that sets out the obligations and responsibilities of all parties, right? You have to take reasonable steps, such as having protect project documentation to confirm and document specific requirements, right? For complex data processing activities, please consider and review details like the schedules to the contract and other administrative instructions outside of the contract, right? Surface management reports regularly to provide the data controllers management with the information to monitor and manage business operations and work with the data controller to put in place an escalation process and a reporting chain for incident reporting for ad hoc events, as well as drawer plans to take remedial actions to address any data breaches or incidences which may or may not occur, right? Under part three, service management, right? The data intermediary should clearly understand the data controller's data protection policies with monitoring and reporting structures in place, right? First and foremost, onboarding and training. Be aware of the data controller's requirements. Uh, for example, uh, having it, um, and acquiring knowledge and resources to train and manage the personal data in accordance um, with their requirements, right? Uh, management meeting with the data intermediaries, hold regular meetings with the data controllers to ensure the steady flow of information uh, that and that the op operations are going according to contractual arrangements and the agreed SOPs, right? Uh, proactive monitoring by the BIs, right? Put in place proactive monitoring practices to meet data controller requirements. Right. Uh, for example, implement database access monitoring that provides real-time dynamic review of access activities to identify possible unauthorized uh, sources of unauthorized access and disclosure. Right. Audits and on-site inspections. Data controllers may conduct audit exercises requesting an independent audit right, uh, report or having uh, on-site inspections at the data intermediaries premises, right? Put in place audit remediation measures to address the data protection risks effectively, right? The last one, run simulation or desktop or tabletop exercises, right? This is test out the effectiveness of ad hoc incident reporting and remediation plans. Train your personnel to respond to predefined situations like data incidences or crisis circumstances. Right, transitioning out, right? Data intermediaries to cease retention of personal data after completion of processing activities within a stipulated time frame. Now, data intermediaries are to ensure that all work done is fully documented and that all documentation is handed over to the data controller upon completion of the project. Right, for IT related projects such as data migration. The documentation could include information such as database mapping, extraction, transformation, and loading of scripts, verification, test scripts, and test results. Data controllers may include exit audits and checks to ensure that the data intermediary abides by its agreed plans. And lastly, ensure that any data migration or transfer of data right, from one DI to another is done in a secure manner in the event of a change of DI. As part of you know complying with the PDPA, we learn how about, learn about developing a data protection management plan or a DPMP in short, right? Accountability, right, basically requires organizations to undertake measures to manage and protect personal data in order to meet the obligations under PDPA. Right. This includes adapting legal requirements into policies and practices, utilizing monitoring mechanisms. Right and controls to ensure that these policies and processes are effectively implemented. It also includes building an organizational culture of responsibility through training and awareness programs. Now, for demonstrating accountability within the organization, right, the you know, the data protection management program or DPMP will be a good start. It is a, basically a four-step program that provides systematic a systematic framework to help organizations establish a robust data protection infrastructure. 
right? It basically begins with the organization establishing a structure for governance and risk assessment, right? Including the mandatory appointment of a data protection officer, developing management policies and practices for handling of personal data, establishment, establishing standard operating procedures or SOPs, and processes to operationalize them. So if you can look at the diagram that's on the screen right now, step one, governance and assessment. Establish, as I mentioned earlier, is to establish a governance structure to define the values and identify risks within the organizational framework. Number two, policies and practices. Develop a data protection policy and data protection practices and processes. Step three, processes. Design processes to operationalize these policies, right? Such as your data breach management plans. Right, number four, review policies, maintenance, right? Basically detailing the steps to keep data protection policies and processes up to date. You know, um, and these reviews are done to keep up to date with regulatory or technological uh, advances, right? Um, so on and so forth. As you know, because our regulatory landscape and as well as our business uh, environment changes from time to time as well, right? So step one, governance and risk assessment. So data protection is a topic that should have brought, uh, should have basically top management, including your board and senior management level oversight. An appropriate governance structure should, ex be, should be established at both board and senior management levels. It is perfectly fine to integrate data protection into existing governance structures within the organization whenever that is possible. Now, to demonstrate commitment to personal data protection, right, senior management of an organization, right, should be responsible from the organization's approach to handling of personal data, right. It is mandatory for organizations to designate at least one individual to be the DPO or data protection officer of the organization. This DPO is responsible for ensuring that the organization complies with the PDPA. And one of the key responsibilities of the DPO is to foster a data protection culture amongst employees and communicating personal data protection policies to stakeholders, right? Now, an account, a culture of accountability towards data protection, right, in an organization is actually very, very crucial, right? This includes awareness and alertness to data protection issues amongst all staff, and right, is dependent on education and buying from the senior management as well, right? Personal data protection cuts across all roles, functions, hierarchy in any organization, right? It should be recognized and practiced by all levels in the organization, right? Including volunteers, agents, contract staff, and rather than being limited to the appointed data protection representatives. In other words, Everybody has a part to play when it comes to protecting personal data and helping your organization comply with the PDPA, right? In particular, staff that handle personal data you know, or are responsible for implementing personal data protection measures, such as, you know, um, IT departments, right? would need to be diligent in ad adhering to the organization's data protection policies and processes. It would thus be important for them to receive and undergo more thorough data protection training. Now, in this regard, organizations should ensure that data protection awareness and education are implemented in a top-down fashion from the board of directors to management and then to the staff. And organizations should also design their training and briefings according to the roles and responsibilities or job functions in the organization and share personal data protection measures and to embed personal data protection related topics into their staff training and communications plans. Now, regular circulars may also be used to generate awareness and to foster a culture of personal data protection, right? Staff should constantly stay alert to risks and take proactive steps in response and this could be backed by incentives and reward systems to encourage such behavior, right? And to promote awareness of management support. So these are the different types of training and communications initiatives that can be put in place in your organization. And again, this is, you know, uh, dependent, what you put in place is dependent on, you know, your staff, your roles, 
or the, the, the scope uh, of your of different uh, staff or your different employees, you know, uh, so on and so forth, right? Whether they come into contact with personal data or not on a regular basis, right? So understanding the risk, right? See the management of an organization should have an understanding of the risk and then be able to review the risk on a regular basis to take into consideration changes in the business model, regulations, technology, and any other factors, right? An organization should also consider other risks arising from data beyond personal data as well. Now, there are basically four general categories of risks, right? One, strategic, which are risks affecting achievement of the strategic objectives of the organization. So this may be governance, strategic planning, major initiatives, and this may affect an organization's ability to comply with the PDPA. Operational risks, right? These are risks affecting the operations of the organizations, for example, sales and marketing, supply chain risks. This may be a factor in whether the organization can comply with the PDPA. Third group, compliance risks. Then these are risks affecting the organization's compliance with regulatory requirements, legal, code of conduct. And, in, and this would include compliance with the PDPA as well. Last group here, financial risks. Risks affecting the financial processes of the organization. For, for example, accounting, reporting, tax risks. This may arise as a result of fines incurred from failing to comply with the PDPA. So risk, the next thing we come to is then risk identification and assessment, right? An essential process for the identification and management of personal data is the DPIA, or the Data Protection Impact Assessment, at the system operational level. The DPIA would enable organizations to identify the personal data handled right, by the system and operating operational processes, as well as the reasons for collecting personal data, identify how the personal data flows through the system or operational process, identify personal data protection risk by analyzing the personal data handled and its data flows against the PDPA requirements or data protection best practices, address the identified risk by amending the system or operational process design or to introduce new organizational policies. Lastly, to check to ensure that identified risks are adequately addressed before the system or the process is effected or implemented. Now, by conducting a DPIA, the organization would be in a better position to assess the handling of personal data if the handling of personal data complies with the PDPA or data protection best practices. And uh, as part of DPIA, it is recommended to establish a data inventory and classify the risk of the data in the context that it is collected, used, and disclosed, right, throughout the data life cycle. <clears throat> From creation, distribution, storage to disposal, this may be mapped onto a risk matrix for assessment and implementation of the appropriate controls, right? For the identified risk levels. Now, risk levels may be determined by considering the following three industry recognized parameters. Okay. Uh, in the event the data is compromised, confiden confidentiality, right? Risk to the organization or individuals arising from unauthorized or inappropriate disclosures. For information to be confidential, the access to some information needs to be restricted as it could harm the interests of the stakeholders, right? Integrity, risk to information quality or corruption. For information to be useful to serve the purpose, it must be accurate and complete as possible. The availability, risk of information not being available to intended users. For information to be useful and serve its purpose, it must be available when it is needed and in the form that's accessible by the intended users, right? Step two, policies and process and practices. Right? An organization's governance and management structure will shape its data protection policies and practices. As part of its corporate governance structure, the organization should develop appropriate data protection policies and practices and communicate them to both its internal stakeholders, the staff, 
and to external parties, in certain cases, vendors and customers. This will provide clarity to internal stakeholders on the responsibilities and processes, right? Related to handling personal data in their day-to-day -day work. Right? Policies also demonstrate accountability to external parties by informing them of the value that the organization places on data protection and how it will protect personal data and its care. Basically, you should consider three areas when developing your, your organization's data protection policies. Generally, people and pro general people and processes. Organizations may consider some general questions in the table to develop their policies to suit their businesses and organizational needs. An organizational governance and risk management structure will shape its data protection policies and practices. Now, um, so after the after general people, and then the last uh, group of questions is, is processes. So ask yourself, you know, ask yourself these questions, like what kind of personal data is handled? What's the purpose of handling all these kind of things? All these questions should be answered and include, and the answers included in your data protection policy so that it would address all, you know, as many possible queries from individuals as much as possible as well, right? So the communication of policies to customers. Now, customers' trust is crucial and organizations should implement personal data uh, protection initiatives to demonstrate accountability. Now, organizations should thus ensure that their data protection policies are communicated clearly and upfront. Notification is important, right? Publish policies and other information in simple language and in prominent locations and other relevant channels. They are easily accessible by customers. Get consent. Ensure that customers understand what they are consenting to, to along their user journey by providing simple and clear consent clauses at appropriate touch points through dynamic consent. Policy updates, right? Manage ongoing customer relationships with clear communications on any policy or service updates, such as, and keep such communications clearly separated from marketing messages. During staff interaction with customers, right? Ensure that the staff assigned to interact with customers are trained in the content knowledge and sensitivity required in handling data protection feedback uh, uh, questions and queries. Accessing and correcting uh, and correction hand request handling. Provide easily accessible channels and proper, pro proper processes for handling customer access and correction requests, which are monitored to ensure prompt response. And com complaints handling procedures, the organization should provide easily accessible channels and proper processes for handling of customers' complaints, right? And these have to be monitored to ensure prompt response as well. So <clears throat> the PDPC actually does have a data protection notice generator. Now, this is a free to use tool for generating basic data protection template notices to inform an organization's stakeholders on how it manages their personal data. Now, each data protection template notice right, comes with a unique questionnaire comprising of seven different questions. There are basically three types of data protection notices uh, that this data protection generator can do. And it's one for customers, right, for employees, and for job applicants, right? Uh, the generated template notices are crafted broadly for general use and purpose only. And an organization needs to ensure that the policies and processes described are aligned with its internal process policies and processes before using these templates. And that the general template meets its requirements and, and it has to be edited if necessary. Where necessary, please consult your company, your organization's legal counsel uh, before publication of such data protection notices. So, good data protection practices, right? Organizations should translate data protection policies into business processes by adopting a data protection by design approach. This is where organizations consider the protection of personal data from the earliest possible design stage of any project and throughout the operational life cycle. 
And this includes designing data protection from the start. And, and this can help organizations to identify data protection issues as early as possible, increase the awareness of data protection across the organization, and thirdly, to meet the data protection obligations under the PDPA, right? Ensuring a data protection by design at the onset and throughout the life cycle of an ICT system also helps to reduce unnecessary delays and, con and contain costs compared to having to retrofit data protection features afterwards as an afterthought, right? Data protection by design should not be an afterthought, but instead be embedded into an organization's practices, right? Ensure compliance with the PDPA is important for an organization's staff as well as third-party organizations to engage, to process personal data on its behalf, right? And to know the organizations, uh, what expects the personal data to be handled and protected, right? The key activity. So state the personal data protection clauses early, clearly in the staff contract, right? And this is um, important because as this, this is a, can be included as a component in your employment contract or the employment handbook, right? Set clear requirements on how vendors should manage and dispose data. Data protection clauses in third-party agreements, for example. And this is where it needs to be included, right? Data protection clauses for cross-border personal data transfer contracts. Right? All these should have clear requirements on how the vendor should manage and dispose of the data. Conduct regular review of contracts. And this is done uh, you know, in due diligence on third-party organizations. Part step three processes, right? Identify, risk identification and mapping. Such tools, such as data flow and consent registers can help to identify and map risk relating to personal data and to design controls, right? So the PDPC does have some <clears throat> tools that help organizations identify risks and gaps. First and foremost, it is the PDPA assessment tool for organizations or PATO in short. This is a free online self-assessment tool that will provide suggestions based on your inputs and recommend resources to help your organization improve its data protection policies and practices. Personal data inventory maps and these manage and these personal data inventory maps basically manage the personal data under the organization's control. There are templates in the links uh, in the web links that are listed above, displayed above. Content registries. Records basically records consent provided by individuals to the organizations for the collection, use, and disclosure of their personal data for a particular purpose. And a data flow in illustration, and basically this allows for the visualization of the flow of data within the organization or for the business process itself. Risk remediation and controls. Now, this risk, once the risks have been identified, right, they should be remediated through the implementation of systems based or process based controls. Now, putting in place system based or process controls and measures, uh, basically, organizations have to put in place relevant you know, uh, <clears throat> controls and measures to address the gaps and risks that have been identified. When developing systems, organizations should consider and build data protection measures into the ICT systems that involve the processing of personal data during the software development life cycle. Right? Controls adopted should also correspond to the risk level and the nature of the data and should include both digital and non-digital solutions, such as encryption and access controls. And it should include processes for managing of service vendors. Organizations are required to communicate clearly their personal data protection requirements to their service vendors and data intermediaries as well. Binding contractual agreements that highlights the responsibilities with regard to the processing of personal data should be in place. And in addition, when the data is transferred internationally, organizations should ensure that such transfers are done in compliance with the PDPA. As shown earlier, one of the assessment toolkits is the PDP assessment toolkits for organizations or the PATO in short. This is a free online self-assessment tool that will provide actionable suggestions and recommended relevant resources to help organizations improve its data protection policies and practices. It will generate an assessment report based on the user's input 
highlight potential gaps in policies and processes and direct users to the relevant PDPC guides, advisory guidelines, and other uh, relevant resources. For risk monitoring and reporting, right, organizations should ensure that all risks, especially residual risks that cannot be addressed by system-based controls and processes are monitored through regular reporting through committees within the organization's governance structure and through operational monitoring and reporting such as management reports. The DPO should ensure that there's regular monitoring, right, of identified personal data protection risks and reporting of data incidences and remediation to the relevant oversight body at the board or senior management level to get their support, direction, and feedback. Now, organizations may wish to develop reporting processes and frequencies every quarter, half a year, or annually, in fact, for various feedback mechanisms for the working level to the senior management. Now, organizations should be able to demonstrate that they have in place such accountable practices such as monitoring and remediation plans as well. Now, managing data breaches, right? Organizations should ensure that all risks, especially risk, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So ma breach management plans can help with breach monitoring and management now. Organizations should develop and implement a personal data breach management process to address these data breaches. The plan may include the following set of activities and, um, and PDPC in one of the very guidelines have what they call the care principle, have put forward the care principle, right? The acronym CARE, C-A-R-E in this case. It basically means contain the, the breach, and this is to prevent further compromise of data and implement mitigating actions to minimize potential harm from the breach, right? That's the first step. A, assessing the risk, gather the facts and assess the effectiveness of containment actions taken thus far before proceeding to implement full remedial actions. R, reporting the incident, right? The PDPC, right? Uh, reporting the PDPC under the PDPA, once uh, the breach uh, you know, has become a notifiable data breach under the PDPA, notifying notification of the affected individuals if required, right? Under the data breach notification obligations as well. Last one, E, evaluating the response and recovery to prevent further data breaches. And this is to consider the actions which can be taken to prevent future data breaches from occurring as well, right? Step four, maintenance, right? Reviewing data protection policies and practices. Now, organizations um, face changes in environment at times. Re regulatory environments, business environments change, right? And this may require revisions, right? To data protection policies and processes. Now, organizations would have to decide whether the revisions should be applied immediately on an ad hoc basis or during a per periodic review of the DPMP. Now, the table shows <clears throat> examples of circumstances that may prompt either immediate or periodic changes. Now, for immediate changes, it was occurrences of major incidences, legislative or regulatory amendments, occurrence of organizational changes. Periodic changes, right? <clears throat> Revisions of DP policies and processes at regular intervals with a pre-specified time interval to ensure that the policies remain relevant, batch review of occurrences of minor incidences or revision of processes or systems that have minimal effect on data. Organizations should also establish a audit structure, right? Organizations can conduct audits to monitor and evaluate the overall implementation of their data protection policies and processes, including conducting an internal audit on a periodic basis, conducting an ad hoc walkthrough and inspection, engaging an external party on a periodic basis or as required to evaluate implementation, obtaining and maintaining certifications for the organization's data protection measures such as a DPM or data protection trust mark. So organizations also need to keep abreast of the changes and developments within and without an organization. <clears throat> and this slide basically 
tells you what you need to monitor from an external environment and an internal environment and how to go about monitoring them, right? External environment includes things like amendments to the PDPA and data protection regulations, issuances of new resources from the PDPC, changes to sector-specific regulations, data breaches in other organizations, data protection best practices by other organizations, technological changes or emerging technologies that may result in increased data protection risk. For monitoring of internal environments, what needs to be done? For example, systems or processes <clears throat> which are newly designed or undergoing major changes, new business engagement or business models, feedback from stakeholders, data incidences, for example, right? <clears throat> So the next thing section we're going to talk about is IMDA's data use and protection programs. This is a data, basically this slide shows the data journey for businesses from, you know, a low amount of personal data being collected and use of personal data to a high uh, level of collection and, uh, and usage of personal data, right? So for new SMEs, uh, PDPC has what you call the SME Go Digital Start Digital Pack, right? It is, and, and for, with this <clears throat> pack, right, it starts with the foundational security solutions, and this is basically to safeguard your <clears throat> new SME's personal data and data loss, and, and to prevent data loss from cyber incidents such as encryption and backup. Now, for more established SMEs, right? There is this data protection essentials 101, right? And this is basically to put in place right, <clears throat> a basic level of data protection and security practices for more established SMEs. And also the this beta data better data-driven business initiative. And this is to get allow in uh, organizations to gain a deeper consumer insights and scale up businesses through the responsible use of data. And last but not least, further down uh, this data protection route, right, for all organizations, once you are sufficiently um, mature, all organizations can consider taking up the data protection trust mark certification or the APEC cross border privacy rules certification or even the APEC privacy recognition for processor system. And this demonstrates the high standards of accountable data protection. Uh, and this basically allows organizations to demonstrate that their organizations are able to, to have a high standard of accountable data protection practice, uh, data protection practices implemented, right? So in essence, this is the gold standard for companies that uh, want to attain a high level of data protection compliance. So data protection, this, I want to talk more now about this data protection essentials program. Uh, basically, it's designed for small and medium-sized enterprises and basically it helps them acquire a basic level, right, of data protection and security practices to protect customers' personal data and to recover quickly from a data breach if that occurs and when it occurs. SMEs can choose from two products that can help them in managing data protection risk. One, for newly incorporated SMEs, they can adopt foundational security solutions such as encryption and backup solutions offered through IMDA's Start Digital program. Number two, as SMEs collect and use personal data more intensively, they can tap onto the one-stop professional service for holistic implementation of basic data protection and security practices through a one-time setup and retainer service. <clears throat> so the benefits and costs of the data potentials, <clears throat> the, the <clears throat> benefits and costs of the of the data protection essentials basically um, would be recognition for effort, right? Uh, these SMEs will be listed on IMDA's website and be awarded with a DPE logo as a recognition for their efforts to put in basic data protection and security practices in place. In the event of a data breach under the Personal Data Protection Act, right, the PDPA, 
the PDPC may consider an organization's implementation of the DPE as a mitigating factor as well. As for the cost of a DPE, well, professional services start from $2,500 for one time setup, and this is inclusive of a six month review. There are grants available for eligible SMEs, right? Retainer services costs may be advised or to be advised by the service providers themselves, and the SMEs can approach IMDAs registered service providers for quotation to confirm the actual fees that they would need to pay as well. The next program I'm going to introduce to you is the Better Data Driven Business or the BDDB program, right? The use of big data analytics is on the rise and it will play a central role in business operations for years to come, right? The capability of businesses to leverage on data sets and information in their companies will be the, the determining factor in their competitiveness both today and in the future. Now, based on an article on Impact Networking website, right? Data-driven organizations are now 23 times more likely to acquire customers, six times as likely to retain customers, and 19 times more likely to be profitable. 73% of businesses said that they have received measurable value right, from implementing big data initiatives. And the average ROI for enterprises using business intelligence and analytics is 1,300%. That's quite a staggering figure, you know, if you ask me. Now, the data analytics made easy for businesses. Says the BDDB program offers a free business intelligence tool to help businesses analyze data and generate insights to address five common business objectives, right? The BI tool basically can help you to improve data quality, to convert your existing business data into visual dashboards to monitor business indicators at a glance, and to help you improve business decision-making by using data instead of your gut feel. Now, focus group discussions were conducted prior to development to determine the common business objectives of businesses, including what are the key information to be captured on each dashboard, as well as the data items that are commonly collected and can be readily exported for solutions. So the five most common business objectives in this case are to grow product sales and services, to acquire new customers, right? To retain and engage your custom, existing customers, to improve HR planning, and to lower your inventory costs, right? So each business objectives will come with a predefined template that lists the uh, that specifies the list of ten to sixteen commonly collected data items that you will need to generate the dashboard. There is an interactive guide available should your organization or you require step-by-step -step guidance on how to use this business um, intelligence tool. So um, I am here to strongly encourage you to try and uh, you know, scan this QR code to download and use the BBDB BI tool uh, to kickstart your data analytics in your organization. Therefore, I'm gonna be I'm gonna pause this slide here for about half a minute to a minute. Please scan the QR code uh, and download the tool and try it uh, yourself to see whether or not it is useful for your for your organization, right? Uh, the BI tool package, right, comprising of the five different templates, will be emailed to you at the end of today's briefing, uh, and in this case. Five lucky winners will actually walk away with a limited edition DPTM Easy Link card as well.
okay, has anybody, everybody had the chance to scan the QR code and, you know, put in and uh, apply to get the tool get? If not, if yes, I'm going to continue on. So um, now we're going to talk about the Data Protection Trust Mark certification or DPTM certification in short, right? The Data Protection Trust Mark or DPTM is a visible badge of honor that recognizes organizations with robust data protection practices to help them increase their competitive advantage. Now, this has been developed based on the PDPA and other international benchmarks. The DPTM can help organizations demonstrate compliance and encourage accountability, right? It can, number two, provide competitive advantages for businesses, right? Three, boost consumers' confidence in organizations' management of personal data. Four, enhance and promote consistency in data protection standards across sectors by positioning the DPTM as the gold standard for organizations to aspire to. Now, the DPTM is an enterprise-wide certification that, access that assesses an organization's data protection policies, processes, and practices, and is valid for three years. Um, Currently, there's uh, at least 181 certified companies that have this data protection uh, trust mark certification. I do believe there are slightly more now uh, in the last few weeks, right? Um, and the benefits to organizations for uh, getting uh, the DPTM would include providing assurance, right? Third party certification helps provide validation of the data protection policies and practices. Going through the certification right, will help companies increase their data governance and uncover privacy risks that may have been dormant. Right? The recommendations provided during the assessment will enable companies to take specific steps to close the gap and mitigate risk. Number two, it raises business competitiveness. The DPTM provides companies with an added advantage, especially in securing business contracts. Uh, there's a, we have a, I mean, IMDA has a certified company, TRS Forensics, a Singapore SME, who was invited to bid on a contract by a European MNC. After intense competition, they managed to secure the contract and they were surprised and asked by, when, and asked the MNC why they are awarded. The MNC basically shared with them that since TRS had the DPTM, and the contract involves data forensics on sensitive data. Therefore, they needed someone whom the MNC needed someone whom they can trust to protect personal data. And as well, the IMDA is also starting to see an increase in demand by government agencies where they have included the DPTM as a requirement in their tenders. Number three, DPTM raises trust, strengthens consumers' trust, right? Trust is an invaluable commodity. I'm sure everybody agrees with that, right? And it takes much effort, resource, and time to build up. And all it takes is to bring it down. It's just one data incident or one data breach. Many organizations we spoke to mentioned that their biggest worry was not the financial penalty, but the reputational fallout, right? The DPTM also allows organizations to demonstrate accountability to regulators, not just in Singapore, but globally, certifications are the way to go for organizations to, to demonstrate accountability to their regulators, right? Um, also, in PDPC's Guide to Active Enforcement, these PTF certified companies may request the option of an undertaking from the PDPC, right? And this undertaking process is intended to allow organizations with good accountability process practices and, effective, and an effective remediation plan, right? Um, with a window of opportunity to implement the remediation plans as well. Um, a successful undertaking would be a very strong mitigating factor for any investigation with the PDPC. Number five, it increases overseas market access. As the DPTM SS is administered by the IMDA, Singapore's reputation for rule of law and stringent quality requirements means that Consumers in overseas markets will view companies with DPTM more favorably. And this will help differentiate companies and brands and turn data protection into a competitive advantage for Singapore companies venturing abroad. So added benefits for certified organizations include, um, as I said, undertakings, right? 
includes uh, advantages in government procurement because more government agencies are including DPTM uh, as strongly encouraged or as a requirement in their tenders. And for cyber insurance, right, DPTM certified organizations can enjoy faster cyber, secure insur cyber insurance application processing and competitive offers uh, with you know, our participating insurers as the, as the DPTM assures insurers that the certified applicant has sound and responsible data protection practices in place. Now, for more information, right, uh, on the data prote uh, protection essentials program or data protection certifications or the better data driven business programs, please feel free to scan the QR codes on your screen 